G'day cobbers, welcome back to the bush. In this episode of Lockout's Four Driving, we're going to disassemble the King's Mark II 120 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery to see what makes it tick. Now, if you've missed out the performance testing in a previous video, click the link up above and we'll get into that. If you've already seen that, let's get straight into it. Now, now there's two versions of this battery. This is the blue top version and allegedly has prismatic cells. There was a previous version which had a black top and that one had pouch cells. Now, if you want to know more about that one, hop on to the DIY 1224 Camping 4 Drive Setups Facebook group. I'll put a link down below. There's a fantastic review there by Chris Eid. Actually, I'll put up a photo now of the pouch cells that were contained in the previous version of this battery. All right, we better get him out the box and check out what he looks like. There's eight screws in the top, and you'll notice I've butchered the uh, case a little bit to get him out. I don't think I'll be making a warranty claim anytime soon. Now, you'll be able to see the BMS on here. Now, unfortunately, I'll zoom in a little bit on that one, and you'll be able to see, probably like me, you can't read Chinese writing. But thankfully, <laughs> Google lends to the rescue. So I'll put up a picture now, and you can read along with me, it's four strings of 12 volt lithium battery protection board, BMS discharge current, 150 amps with equalization. And then the third line says function charge current, 100 amps, Y method, same port. And along the bottom there, it says lithium iron phosphate. So on the outside of the box, it says it's rated to a continuous discharge of 120 amps. And on the BMS, so there's 150 amps. So obviously we're limited by the cells and the BMS has a bit of headroom, so that's fantastic. And on the outside of the box, again, it says it's limited to 60 amps of charge current and the BMS is rated to 100 amps. So again, that's great. The BMS is in excess of both the discharge and the charge currents, so we've got a bit of headway on those. If we zoom out a little bit, next thing I want to do is look at the wiring. Now, the wiring is 10 gauge, it says 10 gauge on this wiring. In short runs, 10 gauge wire is usually rated to 30 amps. So again, if we look at the wiring here, we got four coming from the negative there out of the BMS and four heading into the BMS on the negative side and they're rated to 30 amps per line. So four by three, of course, is 120 amps. So that's great there. So we're not underrating the wire. That was a problem with the previous one. I believe it was only had two lengths of wire there. We should have had three. And we got four here again at 10 gauge. So that's 30 amps each. Three by four, 120. Not a problem there. The last wire, of course, is the output from the positive. And it says on the lug, it's 35 mil. 35 mil from memory is about 160 amps. So no problem there either. Those are not familiar with how BMSs work. They take voltages from individual cells. So there's a negative wire and of course, a few positive wires heading to each individual cell. So we can get individual voltages for individual cells. And then the balancing component of this BMS will be able to level up the voltages across each battery. And we'll get the individual cell voltages when I pull it apart a little bit further. There'll also be a temperature control in here that using a temperature probe somewhere on one of these cells, no doubt hidden under here somewhere, we'll be able to tell the individual cell temperature so we don't get under temperature or over temperature. And we'll actually be testing that further on the video. Righto, the wiring's good. <laughs> Let's check out these prismatic cells. Now the next thing we'll check out is how well this BMS is doing at balancing these cells. It's important that the cells are balanced at the same state of charge. All four cells are at the same state of charge, otherwise you'll be missing out on capacity. Now there's differences between active and passive balances. If you're not sure what they are, I'll click the link up above and you'll be able to learn all about that in that video. But suffice to say, this will be a passive top balancer. So we'll check the voltages on the cells. Stick the old multimeter up there and we'll see what she's reading. So the first cell is coming at 3.496 and the second cell is 3.493 which is very close. The third cell 
coming in at 3.480, which is a little bit lower. And finally, the final cell comes in at 3.496. So the passive balancer looks like it's doing a pretty decent job. And while we're talking about the prismatic cells, one, two, three, four cells, we'll talk about the bus bars that are interconnecting the cells. So it's kind of hard to see <laughs> under the uh, fiberglass sheet here, but these here are the bus bars. Now the best bus bars by far are made from copper because of the high conductivity of copper. But copper is pretty dear, <laughs> so people tend to use mold steel or aluminium. Now you can see the squares on top of these bus bars where it's been laser welded to the terminal of this particular cell. Now it could be nickel plated copper or aluminium or maybe even mild steel that's been nickel plated. The way you tell the difference between a ferrous metal like steel versus aluminium or copper is its magnetic properties. So we've got a magnet here and we're gonna put it on the bus bar and see whether it sticks. And that's not sticking at all. <laughs> you can actually see, if we look down in there, that's one of the BMS voltage connections. Okay, so it's probably, I'd say, an aluminium bus bar. So it might get out the vernier and work out the current capability of that bus bar. Firstly, the width. And that's around about 26 millimeters, as you can see on the vernier. And now, without shorting anything out, we'll check out the thickness. That's around about 2.1, 2.2 as you can see on the vernier. So let's say it's 26 by 2.2. That gives us a cross-sectional area of 57.2. Now, if we use our approximation for the current capability of aluminium, saying two amps of current capability over a short distance per millimeter squared of area, that would give us a current capability of that bus bar, if it's aluminium, of around about 114.4 amps which, well, that's pretty close to 120 amps, remembering that everywhere in the circuit will be the same amount of current. If it was copper, it's roughly double. It's about four amps per millimeter squared. So that would give us a cross-sectional area of about 228.8 amps. So I'm pretty sure that bus bar there, she's a piece of aluminium. Rightio, next, the temperature testing. Okay, so here's the test setup. I've got a power supply here, 14.4 volts, maximum limited to 10 amps. I've got a chilled down steel plate there. The current ambient temperature is 20.9 degrees and the plate temperature is minus 10 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to grab the temperature probe from the BMS, place it against the plate and turn on the power supply. Now it's currently sucking down 10 amps and hopefully it's going to turn off the charge to those cells in just a moment. Okay, well it looks like we have our first issue and that is low temperature charging protection. The plate has now risen from nearly negative 10 to negative 4.5 still sitting at about 21 and a half degrees ambient and this thing is still taking 10 amps even though we've had good contact with the thermocouple probe from the BMS from the cell temperature to the metal plate there and it's still charging. Um, that's an issue <laughs> because if we charge below zero degrees Celsius, uh, this might be a Queensland battery. We charge below zero degrees Celsius, it's, it's going to damage the cells. And it looks like this BMS is happily letting this charge at negative 10 degrees Celsius. So <laughs> it's a big old fail for that one. Now let's have a look at the hot testing. So I've got a piece of steel here, it's rather warm, sitting at 98 degrees Celsius, and we're getting 13.4 volts out. So I'll put that thermocouple probe from the BMS onto that piece of plate, bring it up to 100 degrees Celsius, and see if that affects our output. And we'll give it a minute or two.
and there we go it looks like the voltage is dropping off and it's down to the millivolt range righto so it definitely works if the battery is overheating and it's around about 93 degrees at the moment it thinks that our cells are at it's going to drop off the voltage here to next to nothing so that's good so that works but what about charging what about when you're charging your battery that's actually at a lower temperature on the box it says 45 degrees so that's what we'll test next this time i've got the plate still warm sitting at 83.5 degrees celsius we're getting 13.43 volts out of the battery now i discharged this battery about 20 amp hours to make sure we can put a bit of charge back into it this power supply is set to 14.4 volts to a maximum regulated current of 10 amps so what i'll do is i'll start charging that battery you can see the voltage goes down but the amperage goes up to 10 amps and i'll put the thermal couple probe in our warm plate there and we'll see what happens we'll see if this goes down to zero and that should the bms stops allowing the charge to go into those cells so we'll give it a minute or two to warm up Well, it didn't take that long at all. As you can see now, our amperage has gone to zero. The plate's at 80 degrees Celsius. So the hot weather protection, both the discharge and the charge protection works fine. It looks like it's just the cold weather protection which is missing from this battery. So here's an interesting tidbit. I was chatting with Chris Ede. He's a gentleman who did the teardown on the previous version, the one with the black top and the pouch cells. And he asked me, how do I see the QR codes on the cells? Now, those who aren't familiar with lithium ion phosphate cells is they usually have a QR code on the cell and tells you a wealth of information about the cell. Data manufacturer, the model number, usually the capacity, the number of the cells that have been produced that day, all sorts of wonderful information. So. I said I hadn't, so I went hunting. I took the BMS off, and we come across some interesting information. So firstly, these stickers here, they tell you what the capacity is of the battery. So the manufacturer tests a big heap of batteries, and they put very similar cells together, so you have an equally matched cell pack, or battery pack. Beauty, so that's great. Now, when it comes to the QR codes, now I'll zoom in on this one here a little bit and you'll see something a little bit interesting. That's right, <laughs> the QR codes have been removed. So I'll zoom out again. Now that's interesting. There could be several reasons for that. Now, less reputable manufacturers, you know, the ones you find on Valley, perhaps, maybe eBay, selling those really dirt cheap lithium ion phosphate batteries. What they'll tend to do, the manufacturers will buy second hand cells. When they buy those second hand cells, let's say they're 140 amp hour cells. They've already got a couple of years of use out of them, and now they're at a reduced capacity, as lithium ion phosphate cells tend to do. And they might be at 125 or maybe 130 amp hours. So the manufacturer will grab those cells, match them up like they do here with very similar capacities, and they'll sell it off as a 120 amp hour battery. Now I'm not saying that's what Kings have done here. There could be a different reason. One reason they might be an overrun. So they might have been specifically manufactured for a particular supplier that puts together batteries, and maybe that contractor has run out and then they have to repurpose the batteries. They have to sell them to a different supplier, otherwise they're stuck with these cells. And that may well be the reason that all the QR codes have been removed. Um, <laughs> it's not great that the QR codes have been removed, so we can't tell exactly how old these batteries are, who is the original manufacturer, what date they were manufactured on, any of that information, model number or anything. But it's an interesting tidbit. All the QR codes have been removed and I'd much prefer they were there and that way I could tell you more information about this battery. But because they've been removed prior to King's putting together this battery, well, <laughs> your, your guess is as good as mine. So what are my final thoughts on this battery? Well, 
the performance testing are passed with flying colours, and the hot temperature testing, both charge and discharge, also passed with flying colours. But this temperature probe, when it was down to negative 10 degrees Celsius, was still allowing me to put energy into these cells, and frankly, well, that would have killed the battery. How can we mitigate that? You'd need something like this. Now, that's the Victron Energy Smart Battery Sense, and that works in conjunction with the DC-DC charger, of course, the Victron one, or the MPPT charger, solar charger, that is, which will allow this battery not to charge at those cold negative temperatures. Probably not an issue if you live in Queensland, but if you're a Mexican like me, or even a Taswegian, <laughs> get yourself one of these. All right, guys, now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and if you didn't, by all means, give it a thumbs down. Not once, not thrice, but twice. Thanks, guys. We'll see you in the next one. So if you've enjoyed this content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell icon. It's really important to us, and you won't miss out on our future content. Now, if you want to support the channel, by all means, consider becoming a patron on Patreon, and you'll get things like early access to our videos on YouTube. Either way, we hope to see you out on the tracks.